Okay, I think for um, timing considerations, we'll go ahead and get started with some of the introductory material. So um, welcome everyone this uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, we are today gathered to um, explore the Power Sector Decarbonization Action Plan webinar series. Today's topic um, will focus on Australia. Um, and this event is um, presented by the Clean Energy Ministerial um, Initiatives, the Clean Energy Solution Center, and the 21st Century Power Partnership. So um, my name is Isabel McCann. I am the technical coordinator um, online with you guys today. So I'm going to cover a few um, housekeeping items before we get started. So this webinar is being recorded. I will reiterate that in the chat shortly. Um, and it will be shared with attendees, so um, we'll have a recording available and posted on YouTube and um, emailed out to all attendees and registrants afterward. Um, everyone is automatically muted upon joining um, the webinar, so it is broadcast style, so um, that is just to ensure that there's not interruptions. Um, that said, we do have a chat feature, and um, I would like to encourage everyone who is joining us today to um, drop an introduction into the chat. Um, and use the chat um, just for any conversation or um, input that you might have. Um, specifically for Q&A, so this event will conclude with a, a question and answer session at the end, so we want this to be interactive, um, and there is a specific Q&A function in the toolbar of Zoom. So um, you'll see there, that down at the bottom, and you can enter your questions um, in there for our presenters, and then they will be addressed at the end of the event. Um, if you have any technical issues, um, please feel free to chat myself. Um, there is another co-host online with me today named Holly Darrow. You can chat either one of us, and um, we'll do our best to help you with any technical issues. You can adjust your audio through the audio settings. If you're having issues, there is a dial-in and listen by phone, and all that information can be found in your registration email that you were sent upon registering for this event. Um, at, at the end of the event, there is a survey that will launch um, just about, uh, you know, kind of just about this, this event itself um, and how we can improve um, the events that we host. And we really do appreciate if you guys take the, um, you know, one to two minutes to answer that survey. So um, with all of that, I am going to hand it over to um, our moderator for the day, Dr. Doug Arendt from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Wonderful. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, a productive discussion um, in this uh, follow on uh, effort to focus on Australia's uh, clean energy um, uh, action plan for power sector decarbonization. If I had the next slide, please. Uh, just very quickly, um, we're going to have two uh, quick uh, introductory overview. Uh, presentations of both the Clean Energy Solutions Center and the 21st Century Power Partnership. You will learn how they uh, complement many other activities of the uh, Clean Energy Ministerial. And then we're going to dive in. We're uh, very pleased to have uh, three speakers from Australia joining us with complementary perspectives of uh, the uh, power sector decarbonization efforts in Australia. And uh, we'll have an overview from uh, their Department of uh, Climate Change, uh, Energy and uh, Environment and Water, and then uh, their National Research uh, Organization, uh, and finally a, a company leading on battery storage. Um, and uh, to do that, let me honor then uh, our speakers, if you would go to the next slide. And um, the, the two uh, beginning speakers uh, will be uh, Jal Desai, who uh, as at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, helps uh, manage and run the Clean Energy Solution Center, and then Pratik Joshi, uh, who has helped run the 21st Century Power Partnership. Uh, you'll get more on both of those uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And then very, very pleased uh, at an early hour in Australia this morning uh, to welcome Sandra Choi, who's at the Department of Climate Change, Energy, uh, Water, Energy Environment and Water. John McKibben, who's uh, the Energy Networks Research Leader at the Commonwealth Science and Industrial Research Organization, more commonly known as CSIRO. Uh, and then Brian Craighead, who's the CEO of Energy uh, Renaissance. It's a, a leading uh, battery storage company that is uh, really dealing all the way from uh, materials up through uh, end products. 
and uh, very excited to hear about uh, the efforts that they are all putting together, uh, working collectively uh, with Australia's uh, opportunities and challenges. So uh, with that, let's uh, turn to the next slide. And I believe that I will hand the floor uh, over to Jal and uh, a quick overview of the Solution Center, please. Thank you, Doug. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll give a brief overview about Clean Energy Solution Center. Next slide, please. So Clean Energy Solution Center is one of the initiatives under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The objective of Clean Energy Solution Center is to accelerate the transition of clean energy markets and technologies in developing nation. This initiative is co-led by Australia and US and Enrol is operating agent of this initiative. And we have got 40 plus partners to deliver services free of charges to the users to help developing countries for clean energy transition. Next slide, please. So CSC offers three services. So the first one is Ask an Expert. So Ask an Expert is designed to help policymakers in developing nations and emerging economies to identify and implement clean energy policy and finance solutions. The Ask an Expert, we have a network of more than 50 experts from around 15 countries. And to date, we have responded 300 plus requests submitted by 90 plus government. And again, this is free of charge for developing nations. The second service that Solution Center offers is training and capacity building. So since inception, we have delivered 300 webinars training more than 20,000 public and private sector stakeholders. And we try to do one webinar every month. The third resource is resource library. So we have more than 1500 curated reports, um, technical reports, brief, policy brief, journal articles on various topics. And again, this is not technology agnostic. It's technology agnostic, basically. So please feel free to uh, refer to those resources. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Back to you, Doug. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, now it's a pleasure. Um, if you go to the next slide, we'll uh, turn the floor over to Pratik Joshi to a brief overview of the 21st Century Power Partnership. Great, thank you, Doug. And hey, good morning, good evening, everyone. And I think we can go to the next slide to just introduce the 21st Century Power Partnership, otherwise known as 21 CPP. And so we are a solutions, uh, clean energy ministerial work stream, and we work also very closely with the Solution Center on events like this. And our mission is to accelerate the transition to clean, efficient, reliable, and cost-effective power systems. And so, of course, all of us know that the power system is changing dramatically, and I'm excited to hear more about how that change is occurring in Australia, one of the countries that we've worked closely with over the past year. And so we look across all of these changes in the generation portfolio, the increasing electrification of end uses, other technology like smart grid, energy efficiency, demand response. Look at all the cross-cutting issues that affect the power sector from operations, transmission, market design. And we've really, over the past couple of years, started to focus on thinking about what are these best practices for planning, building, and operating a power system. And so we work on these best practices in a variety of ways, and I can talk a bit more about that in the next slide. So often our annual program of work includes some thought leadership reports. We also work directly with countries, sometimes in a multilateral setting, sometimes on a a one-on-one -on -one basis. So over the past year, we've worked with several different countries on these action plans for power sector decarbonization. And those are really highlighting the best practices that we've compiled and synthesized in planning, building, and operating. In the past, we've also conducted uh, capacity building workshops. On the past year, we've done workshops and webinars on topics like resource adequacy and thinking about how resource adequacy, how basically assuring resource adequacy changes with high renewable systems. 
We've also done workshops on transmission planning, transmission operations, and those are all available online as well. And I can drop those links in the chat. Next slide, please. So the past couple of years, we building off of a report that we led synthesizing some lessons learned from a variety of the clean energy ministerial work streams on best practices for planning, building and operating power systems. As a natural next step from that, we started working directly with countries shown here to develop these action plans. And these are really country led action plans that are showcasing what they are doing in planning, building and operating and what some of the best practices are based on their own context. So we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we highlighted Chile's action plan and some of the activities they were doing to decarbonize their power sector. Of course, today the focus is on Australia. And so these reports as well are, are all available on the 21 CPP website, and I'll link to that as well. And then we can go to the next slide. So where we're going in the year ahead, well, we're here in this webinar series, um, I think webinar number three. And then we also plan to continue this work with a second cohort of countries. So over the past summer, we had announcements from the United States, Canada, Brazil. We also plan to work with some other countries who will be developing similar action plans inspired by the first cohort of Australia, Chile, the European Union, India and the United Kingdom. So lots of exciting things to come in the year ahead. And with that, I think we'll go to the next slide and dive into the, the meat of today's presentation. Thanks everyone. Wonderful, thank you Pratik uh, very much. So Sandra, I'm very pleased that uh, you've joined us and are going to give us a uh, high level overview of uh, some very deep and uh, and uh, broad work that the UN colleagues have uh, codified in the in the action plan, and I would encourage uh, attendees and and others who are going to watch this uh, as a recording to uh, to do uh, check in on the uh, online resources that will be in much more detail. So, Sandra, over to you, please. Hi, everyone. My name's Sandra. I'm from the International Climate and Energy Division from DQ. That's a very long name, Department of Climate Change, Energy and Environment and Water in Australia. Um, I do have my colleague, Anna Mazzolini, who's also online. Um, she might pipe in um, later on if I missed anything or answer some questions. But um, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to present an update on the action plan. Um, we did initially present this earlier this year, but noting that we have a shorter time today, I'll be focusing on more recent developments um, around unlocking renewables energy storage and energy efficiency in Australia. Uh, next slide, please, Isabel. Uh, so before I start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. This is something that we practice in the spirit of reconciliation and in respect for the traditional custodians and their connections to the land. Um, I acknowledge the Wajuk Nuna and Gadjigal peoples who are the traditional custodians of the lands that Anna and I are streaming from today. That's Perth and Sydney respectively. I also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations people um, attending today. Next slide. So let's start with Australia's energy context. Um, we are a population of about 26 million people, the majority of whom are concentrated on the east and southeast coast of Australia. Our electricity markets around the country are segregated. So we have the national electricity market and the wholesale e electricity market on the west, which are the largest um, electricity markets in the country. 80% um, of Australia's power consumption occurs along the east and southeast coast. So the NEM itself is actually about 10 times larger than the WEM, which is um, generating about 200 terawatt hours in 2022. Um, last year, renewables provide about 36% of Australia's electricity generation, over 16 gigawatts of which came from solar rooftop um, PV. Next slide. Um, so what does it 
look like when we try to forecast and plan our energy market? Well, the Australia's um, energy market operator, AMO for short, um, oversees the national electricity market developed and they develop the integrated systems plan every two years, which is a whole systems plan to develop the NEM. It identifies the optimal investment in generation, storage, transmission, and system services that are needed to deliver low cost, secure, reliable, and, um, uh, and reliable power system for us. It also guides investors and decision makers on the optimal timing and placement of these resources. So under the ISP, um, the step change scenario forecasts that the transformation of the NEMS energy mix features an accelerated phase out of coal with a mass deployment of renewables and energy storage capacity into 2050. Next slide. In order to reach 100% renewables, key priorities for Australia in the near term is to deliver on renewables generation, transmission and storage. Electrification of our transport industries and homes will almost double our electricity demand by 2050. So to accommodate for this, renewables generation, particularly from wind and solar, needs to double every decade, reaching a ninefold increase by 2050. Um, 61 gigawatts of firm dispatchable capacity and addi additional power system security systems in the form of batteries, pumped hydro, or other storage will also be needed by 2050. Um, in a nutshell, the most pressing need for Australia in the next decade is the need for deep storage capacity, and that will ensure resilience and reliability in our grids. Um, next slide. Sorry, I'm zooming through the, the first couple because um, we, we covered this in the um, earlier original action plan, um, and I'm short on time, so I might have to skip through this one but as well. But I want to note that CSIRO, our leading science and innovation agency, has recently published a roadmap for deploying renewable energy storage. And this covers various technologies, including batteries, mechanical, thermal, and chemical storage approaches. Sorry, Isabel, can you hop to the next one, please? Um, stepping away from the forecasts and roadmaps, Australian government is seeking an ambitious net zero uh, trajectory for Australia. The government has committed to key targets to drive an increased scale and pace towards net zero. So firstly, we legislated clear emission reduction targets, which will deliver on 43% of reduction on emissions based on 2005 levels by 2030 and a net zero by 2050. Um, to deliver on this, we have set ourselves an interim renewable energy target of 82% renewables by 2030. The government's Powering Australia agenda is investing $23 billion in growing and modernizing our electricity grid and boosting energy performance and supporting electrification. This requires a coordinated whole system effort to realize on government and private sector spending to capitalize on our immense uh, potential for renewable energy. We are transforming our grids to run mainly on renewables, but we recognize that it's not just about technology. It's also about infrastructure, jobs and skills growth, equity sharing, supply chain, and market regulatory frameworks. So this is in the essence the core of the government's Powering Australia agenda and the ensuing policies presented today. Next slide, please. So AIMO's um, integrated systems plan indicated that around 10,000 kilometers of new transmission is required in Australia's East Coast network by 2050. That is in comparison to the 40,000 kilometers already in place today. Through rewiring the nation, the government is providing $20 billion in low cost finance through either debt or equity to expand, upgrade and modernize our grid. Um, this includes expanding interstate transmission links, building infrastructure for renewable energy zones, um, as you can see across this map here on the right. Numerous projects are already underway, forming a pipeline of renewables, battery and transmission projects with further investments to be allocated through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation as capital investment in energy grid projects. This will allow some risks to be borne by government, enabling major projects to be built sooner through lowering the cost of finance and by extension, the cost to customers. Um, we're not just looking at the big picture, we're also looking at our remote communities as well. So many remote First Nation communities are powered by expensive diesel generators. Um, 
the government is investing 75 million into First Nation community microgrids programs that will help deliver solar infrastructure and distributed energy resources in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And that will help provide clean, cheap and reliable energy um, to our wider communities as well. Um, next slide, please. Besides the grid infrastructure and unlocking renewables in our grids, Australia is increasing the deployment of dispatchable renewable energy storage, such as batteries, pumped hydro and thermal energy. The aim of the capacity investment scheme is to encourage new investment in clean dispatchable capacity, support reliability and reduce the risk of price shocks that Australia um, has been experiencing in our changing energy markets. The scheme expects to bring on at least $10 billion of new investment and six gigawatts of clean dispatchable capacity by 2030. Um, tenders will seek bids for storage projects, um, including batteries, thermal energy storage, um, hydrogen and pumped hydro. The scheme in general operates on a contract for difference principles. So selected projects will be offered long-term Commonwealth underwriting agreements for um, an agreed revenue floor or ceiling. Uh, these capa capacity investment scheme agreements will last up to five, 15 years, sorry, and will provide investors with better certainty to realize their project. Um, on a slightly smaller scale, we're also deploying an army of community batteries. Um, these are shared solutions for local neighborhoods that allow wider community to share use of excess solar energy collected while accessing other benefits that includes better voltage regulation by reducing peak demand or absorbing excess energy that might cause voltage spikes in the local network. It will also enable um, neighborhoods to share solar power with households that don't have solar and um, hopefully reduce power bills for everyone around. The community batteries for household solar program will install 400 batteries, much like this one that you see on the right across Australia. And this will provide shared storage for up to 100,000 households. Next slide, please. Um, in many ways, decarbonizing the power sector is driven by the consumer and our behaviors with en energy use. Um, residential buildings make up about one quarter of Australia's electricity use and more than 10% of our emissions. Many of our older homes don't even meet um, modern energy efficiency standards with more than 7 million built before these requirements were existed. Commercial buildings such as shops, schools, industrial premises, they're responsible for about 20% of our overall electricity use and um, about 10% of our emissions in Australia as well. The Australian government is implementing measures to drive down energy costs and usage to improve um, confidence and transparency in our home products and appliances. Um, we are establishing a 1.7 billion energy savings package, which will make energy efficiency upgrades more accessible to homeowners and tenants. Under this um, $1 billion fund will be provided to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Um, they will partner with lenders to support energy upgrades to more than 110,000 homes, including um, battery ready solar PV, um, insulated windows and other modern appliances. We're also supporting Australians to make informed choices about the energy performance of where they live. So um, through the Nation, ooh, nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme, NATHIS. Um, this will expand to provide energy ratings to existing Australian homes and help households to find opportunities to understand where they can save and um, also give assurances to lenders to help them verify green investments and offer green loans. Australians can also seek a star rating for their home's energy efficiency and make informed choices when it comes to energy upgrades that can help make their homes more comfortable, whether they are renting or buying. Uh, a similar rating system has also been introduced to our commercial buildings. Um, and this is through the National Australian Built Ener Environment Rating System, Neighbours. 
Further review and updates to our building standards, that's the National Construction Code, are underway and this will also help to increase stringency and take commercial buildings closer to net zero. Um, here on my last slide, I guess um, what we want to bring awareness to is that delivering a net zero economy requires a substantial workforce transformation. Um, not only are we talking new, new jobs and skills, um, the government is also interested in investing in training pathways, technologies and industries that will uh, emerge over the next 30 years. So we are considering all levels of education, training, migration and workplace relations systems to um, to help deliver on uh, a net zero economy. The new energy apprenticeships program will, will encourage apprentices to choose clean energy careers, improve the retention rates and deliver more successful completions for Australian apprentices in clean energy occupations. The government is spending 95.6 million to support um, new energy apprenticeships. And this program will see eligible apprentices receive up to $10,000 over the course of their program. Um, and that will assist with the uh, cost of living. I might end things there. So hopefully that does bring me to 10 minutes or. Great, hey, thanks Sandra. Um, so there are a number of um, references in there as well. And I think I'm you know, just reflecting on the the breadth of the program from the government's perspective. So investing in efficiency, jobs, supply chain, the grid, uh, technologies for the grid. And I presume also as shown on this slide, uh, the, the, the demand side, i.e. what's happening with electric vehicles and, and other pieces as well. So quite comprehensive. So I'm very pleased to um, turn the floor to Dr. John McKibben. Um, and uh, talk a bit about uh, what CSIRO is doing to uh, help enable this from a technical perspective. And I think uh, you all will find this uh, quite fascinating uh, as we go forward. So thanks, Sandra. We'll come back with uh, questions in a, in a few minutes. John, I'll throw to you. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. And I thank Sandra for such an excellent overview of what's happening in Australia. So um, I'm calling from CSIRO, which is uh, the Australian equivalent of the US national labs. And for my talk, I was hoping to provide a bit of an overview about some of the technical challenges and opportunities of the transformation that's happening here in Australia. But firstly, I'd like to just quickly also acknowledge the, the traditional owners uh, of the country that I'm calling from, which are the, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. So right now in Australia, we are undergoing a massive transformation. So Sandra outlined some of those big multiplication numbers in terms of capacity and transmission assets. Um, and as we are, are going through this rapid uptake of renewable energy, um, Australia is now at the forefront of the challenges and opportunities of the energy system transformation. So we find ourselves now building the future energy operating system in real time. So I was hoping to, to dive into a few, three of the, the, the key challenges of this future energy operating system and some of the work that we're doing at CSIRO uh, to assist with that capability uplift happening in Australia. So at a high level, we're talking about a significant transformation in the transmission system and the, the market operators capability with the adoption of large scale renewable, re renewable energy. So wind, solar, batteries, and other inverter-based resources. Um, in the local distribution networks, we're looking at the adoption of rooftop solar and batteries as the key challenge. Um, and in, in the, the technical land, we call that distributed energy resources, which are just um, any, any resources that are installed in the distribution networks. And right down at the customer interface, we're looking at a significant electrification of heating, cooling, hot water, transport, uh, particularly transport electric vehicles. Um, and a lot of these, these loads are flexible loads. And I'll sort of do a bit of a deep dive into the key challenges there. So in terms of the challenge one, the transmission system and this inverter-based resources. So we are rapidly replacing fossil fuel-based generators with variable renewable energy is what they call it in the States or inverter-based resources. So we're just talking about wind, solar, large-scale batteries that are installed in, in the grid. So we are, have a, the Australian energy market operator has a target to operate the power system with 100% renewable, 
variable renewable energy by 2025. And this is already happening in some regions, including South Australia. However, the existing power system relies on these synchronous generators for several stability features, such as system inertia and system strength, which is forcing the system operator to maintain spinning reserve, which is mostly gas, gas generators. So in terms of what we need to build, the capability uplift, I thought it'd be, it'd be useful to sort of paint a picture of the end state that we're all targeting. So at some time very soon, the system operator will, will, will have real-time visibility, predictability and control of what's happening in the, in the, the transmission system. So they'll have an, uh, a network of phase and measurement units, which are basically these high sample rate measurement units that are positioned across the transmission system. They'll have si signals processing and state estimation methods applied to provide real-time visibility of what's happening in the system and detecting faults and other anomalies in real time. They'll also have day ahead or two days ahead resource adequacy analysis using advanced weather forecasting, demand forecasting and generation forecasting to assess the supply demand balance and identify any shortfalls in advance. They'll also be dynamically running these dynamic security assessments, which incorporate what's called electromagnetic transient analysis, which is essentially a high resolution analysis of what's happening in, this, in the power system, analyzing a range of different uh, security contingencies um, and identifying any um, interventions necessary. We'll also be uh, uplifting the, the inverter-based controls within those renewable energy um, uh, inverter-based resources. So we essentially turn the, these inverter-based resources from an operational challenge to a, a very dynamic, responsive source of stability in the system. So that gives you a picture of, of what, what we're targeting. In terms of what we're doing at CSIRO, so we're involved in the Global Power System Transformation Initiative, which NREL is also a party of, but in Australia, we're collaborating with the Australian Energy Market Operator and also a consortium of universities and consultancies and also EPRI in the States um, to address some of these, these operational challenges. So some of the, the facets of that are looking at, for instance, the control room of the future. So how do we enhance the control capability of the Australian Energy Market Operator? Second challenge, distribution systems. So we're looking at a significant, uh, so we're leading the world in terms of the uptake of rooftop solar. Um, and this is ultimately forecast to provide over half of installed generation capacity in the national electricity market, which is unprecedented. It's, it's, it's quite a big deal internationally. And so the whole world is looking at us right now. However, these distribution networks were not designed for this. So they don't have very much visibility or control of what's happening in the distribution networks. And the problem with that is that if we if this is poorly managed, that we have significant power quality or reliability issues, including over voltage, which can lead to premature failure of customer devices, et cetera. But mostly what's been happening is we're seeing conservative connection limits. So a, 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 lim a limit ex uh, on the export capacity of rooftop solar systems which is ultimately an underutilization of generation network capacity. So in the absence of this visibility that we're forced to, to play it safe. So to, to address this, there's a significant capability uplift happening among the distribution networks in Australia. Once again, with a focus on real-time visibility, predictability and control. So in the future end state, and this is already happening right now, we'll have millions of smart meters and other network monitoring devices collecting millions of data points across the, the distribution network. This is similar to the transmission challenge, but it's an order of magnitude more complex because of the order of complexity. Distribution networks are much, much more complex than transmission networks. You've also got this, the same signal processing and state estimation methods, but once again, it's pushing the limits of what's possible with the computational capacity we have available. We're also seeing the introduction of operational forecasting to distribution and also advanced distribution system modeling. Um, previously, this was, was only applied for planning purposes, but increasingly this is moving into operations. And essentially that's, that's being used to, to assess the available capacity and assigning that network capacity across the range of customers in the network. We're also seeing the introduction of dynamic network controls, things like onload tap changes, which are a way to dynamically change the voltage also reactive power compensation devices, phase switching devices. So a whole bunch of smart kit that's being installed in the distribution network. But also we're turning these, these uh, inverters at every home and business into a much smarter piece of equipment. 
that has dynamic export and import limits applied, but also dynamic network support incentives so that those devices are rewarded for providing network support to the system and also dynamic network prices to, to make sure that the price signal reflects the local and, and temporally specific uh, constraints in the power system and rewards those customers appropriately. So in this space, we're, we're collaborating with a national consortium of uh, market operators and um, market um, players, also industry organizations uh, to facilitate the integration of distributed energy. In terms of our work, we're focused on the interoperability standards and testing protocols for these DER devices, enhancing visibility and pre predictability um, so that the, the market operator and distribution networks can manage those devices appropriately but also working with distribution networks to enhance their capability and trans transparency of their, their planning and operations. Third challenge. Um, so we are also um, electrifying heating, cooling, but particularly transport, industrial processes, other demand side changes. And this is driving a structural break or step change in energy use. So the forecast is currently looking at a doub doubling of energy use, mostly from electric vehicles. And if unmanaged, this could translate to a significant increase in generation and network loads. So we've already got pretty poor utilization of our generation and network assets. This could be um, accentuated if it's, if it's poorly managed. Um, so in terms of the end state on the customer interface, we once again are looking at real-time visibility, predictability and control. You'll see that, that a lot. So introducing much more digital capability at the customer interface. And what this looks like is Home energy management systems, building energy management systems, also smart devices that are analyzing and forecasting power requirements and also external conditions. We've got these smart devices, including hot water systems, air conditioners, pool pumps that provide load flexibility to assist with aligning demand with generation, serving as a big battery to the power system. Also, electric vehicles and battery storage systems, which are dynamically drawing and injecting power to balance supply and demand across the power system. And at all times, the customer has complete transparency and is rewarded financially for their contribution and can opt out at any time. And to, to paint a picture, the introduction of electric vehicles um, is one of the, the biggest sources of storage available in the power system. So it's really crucial to um, bring customers on board with that journey and leverage those assets for the benefit of the grid and for the, ultimately for the benefit of the customer as well. So in terms of what we're doing in that space, uh, so at Syro we've been developing a cloud-based IoT data management and application platform. So it's essentially trying to introduce improved visibility of these flexible loads and distributed energy sources. So ultimately this will enable the customers to participate in the energy markets as sources of flexible demand. So hopefully that paints a picture of, of some of the key areas we're looking at operationally, but also um, looking at the, the, the planning challenges. Sandra mentioned there's a whole bunch of significant changes that are occurring right now. Um, rooftop solar set to double, grid scale solar and wind set to triple, storage capacity multiplied, multiplied by seven and 10,000 kilometers of transmission lines. So there's an un unprecedented overhaul occurring right now. And so, we're really calling, we've got a, quite a call to action in Australia to, toward coordinated and integrated policy and planning. And that means local, state and federal government policy, distribution, transmission and system planning, also electricity, gas, hydrogen and transport fuels, demand side and supply side solutions, government and industry and research. And so right now we're, we're working with um, AMO, the government DQ, but also state governments, the networks, and the, the research sector to address this challenge. So um, yeah, hopefully that gives you a sense of, of what we're up to here in Australia, but welcome the conversation shortly. Fantastic, John, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, gives a, a good sense of uh, a lot of depth and a lot of breadth that, uh, that needs, to, needs to happen and as well as a, a sense of uh, collaboration, I think is the, maybe the way to think about it. So um, we're going to hold on on questions and dialogue here, and uh, give uh, uh, give Brian uh, Craighead, the CEO of uh, uh, Energy Renaissance, uh, a couple of minutes to talk about uh, what they're doing uh, in the uh, in the battery and storage market. So Brian, over to you. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I guess in the first two presentations, 
you've seen uh, how pivotal battery storage, the kind of uh, consistent supply of large scale batteries into the into Australian market is going to be for pretty much everything we're talking about. So what you're looking at there is Australia's first gigafactory that can produce about a gigawatt hour a year of batteries all made here with the exclusion of cells. Everything else is made here. Um, now, the problem that this is solving is that what, what we learned going back six, seven years ago is that we need a consistent stream of um, batteries into the market, in our case, lithium ion batteries, but they were problematic to import them. We needed ones that were a bit different from the normal. We needed them to be much more robust in hot climates so need less parasitical cooling, much more rugged because a lot of these installations you're looking at are in unfriendly places for, for typical battery designs. We need a whole bunch of stuff. And so eventually we decided, and of course we're three quarters of a percent of the global market. So with everybody in the world, these batteries, price goes up, supply goes down. So all of these projects were at risk because there was no sovereign supply of batteries. So really our, the reason we exist is to help provide sovereign supply into these kind of mega projects. Um, and so I wanted to kind of just give you a quick background to this. I'm repeating what you've heard in a much, much cleverer way, but just as a context for where we, for, for how we look at the role of batteries. You, you've heard we are still one of the highest emitters of carbon dioxide in the world as a per capita. Um, and it's energy sectors is, is contributing to about a third of that. Yes, it's true, we've got all this great sun and we are adopting solar at a crazy rate, but that is in itself, as you've already heard from John, that that's actually causing problems. Um, what we do most fundamentally, everything we're talking about here, um, whether it's distributed right down to residential, it's commercial, it's grid firm, firming, uh, all of these projects require uh, a consistent supply of storage uh, to enable. It's an enabling technology. It's actually, we often view it as a critical energy um, requirement. It's actually, in some ways, a critical defense requirement as well, because we are at a point now where if we don't, if we're not able to supply to the scale we need, we're going to have, we're going to have trouble. So fundamentally, there are three problems that you've heard already in, in this part of the world that um, are uh, quickly becoming uh, critical. The first thing is um, our reliance, the reliability and resilience of the grid is, is, is increasingly in question. Um, it's exacerbated by the impact of uh, climate change, and that is only going to get worse. Um, so we and, and we have a 25, 26, 27 million people spread over a massive country. So a lot of folks are the end or edge of grid, and that is increasingly uh, un unreliable. The infrastructure is very expensive uh, to maintain, and that is aging. And again, in a lot of places, regional rural particularly, there's an aging infrastructure. As you said, it wasn't designed for this two-way sharing of um, distribution of energy, and it's getting very expensive. Um, and actually, the economics of it, uh, of it are, are no longer viable. So we're going from centralized to hub and spoke power generation quite quickly. And uh, we continue to cause ourselves problems, punch yourself in the face, step on rate, whatever the metaphor for emitting carbons at far too fast a rate. So these problems are exacerbated, uh, ironically, exacerbated by the extreme shift into renewables. So there's, I guess, from our perspective, this won't be any surprise, but from our perspective in, in this market, and we view Australia as, as the hub for it's exactly the same problems in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, South Africa, particularly having problems. So these problems are the same in those markets as well. First, as you've heard, the role of batteries, um, and, and we're not just talking utility. In fact, to be honest, more and more we're seeing commercial and industrial, so that mid-sized battery, rather than you were talking a few megawatt hours to 20, 30 megawatt hours, Lots and lots of those are starting to play a distributed role in helping stabilize the grid. Uh, increase it, uh, that's become an increasing driver. Of course, integrating renewables. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the larger solar farms and wind farms as well, but a lot of the original renewable generation projects have come up for the midterm financing. In this part of the world, they're typically financed over 20 to 25 years. And at the midterm, they refinance. And in the life 
of those projects in the midterm refinance, and they have now an obligation to retrofit energy storage. It's this tsunami of requirements because, of course, now they haven't to contribute to the to the grid in a better way. That is becoming quite a big unseas, a bit of a tsunami of projects that are coming online that are driven by the finance market. It's almost invisible that one. Of course, reducing carbon footprint. Uh, we have all sorts of commitments that we're not really on track to meet yet. And um, we are, as, as, as an interesting aside with this, we are actually seeing an awful lot of um, mid-sized diesel generation replacement now. The economics have tipped over. So we are putting batteries in to replace big diesel generators, powering pivots in agricultural farms, et cetera, and agricultural um, irrigation. Um, and, and that's because the economics of diesel have really got to the point where the, the, over the life of the battery, it's, it's, become, it's become cheaper to do it uh, with a electri electrifying it. That, again, it feels a little bit like a, a much larger market than we're, we're picking up on because it's sort of by stealth kicking in. And that will cause problems as well. It's good, but it will cause problems. There is, a, no surprise, aging infrastructure, distribution, small, small, um, small population. Uh, Price is going up. Price is going up quite steeply in some cases. The further from the centre you are, the worse the price increase. Um, so you are in a position where the last the last person off the grid picks up the biggest bill, and so there is an awful an awful urgency in a lot of, a lot of cases to reduce costs quickly. Um, we are seeing in the early days there were power purchase agreements with generation facilities, but they're now starting to be much more holistic in a in a. In a generation and storage um, uh, financed agreements that kind of fund the shift to renewables and that's largely driven by the economics. Um, it's a carrot and a stick. The, the carrot of course is you're reducing carbon emissions, you're getting some energy um, certificates uh, but predictability pricing and the stick is the price of power has gone up so high and the reliability is reducing to the point of folks having a run. And I guess the final thing we're seeing and this is probably a larger picture. I want to kind of just leave this with you. Probably the biggest supporter for us in the early days of having sovereign supply uh, um, was the federal government, in particular defence. Um, so there's a real feeling that um, uh, as we shift, our, our gloves are down. If, we're, if our grid is less and less reliable, that's a real problem for the country, both from an economic perspective, from a defence perspective. Um, and so sovereign supply to meet this kind of big projects has, has become critical. We're the only country in the world with all the materials for lithium ion cells. Uh, but right now we sell the wool and buy back the jumpers. And so the idea of having a sovereign supply where we can protect our economy and protect ourselves uh, as the world um, gobbles up all the batteries, that's become increasingly a kind of a nation building call. Um, so we are seeing this more and more, that that's what, what's driving it is a, is a larger nation building call. We need sovereign supply. So those five are the, the kind of the main role battery, uh, batteries are playing in the commercial space that we see today. And with that, I will pass back to Doug. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Um, Sandra and John, if I could ask you to uh, come back on and join us for the panel discussion, Pratik and Jal as well. Uh, if you'd like to uh, to turn your cameras back on. Um, there are two questions in the chat that uh, might be worth a, a quick uh, set of reflections on, and I've got a third uh, that I would actually like to ask each of you. Uh, the first two relate to, I'll, I'll, I'll call them broadly, cybersecurity rather than just specifically blockchain. Uh, and then also uh, opportunities for companies. So Brian, you're, you're clearly leading one and Sandra, I think you talked about uh, relatively significant government resources that are gonna be put to bear. And, and John, I'm sure that you're working with a whole cadre of entrepreneurs and startup companies as well. So um, uh, maybe John, maybe I'll turn to you first. I mean, how do you, how do you th see this space uh, affecting uh, the startup community and, and, and entrepreneurs? And then Brian would love to get your reflections as well. And Sandra will end with you. Uh, thanks, Doug. So I think from an Australian perspective, we're seeing an incredible rate of innovation happening right now. And often innovation comes from 
a bit of a, a challenge and we've got a significant what they call a crisis opportunity. So we've got a lot, a lot going on in Australia, particularly at the distribution interface and at the customer interface. So some of the really exciting startups that we're working with at the moment are looking on, um, for instance, distribution network state visibility. So processing this, these incredible amounts of data to figure out what's actually happening in the low voltage distribution networks, but also um, DERM systems, those systems that provide um, dynamic um, control signals, but also pricing signals to these distributed energy devices. So that's one area where in, in Australia we're world leading, partly because we've got such a high uptake of, of these distributed energy resources. But another area that's, that's really crucial right now is these what's sometimes called virtual power plants, which are basically a way to aggregate a significant number of these distributed energy resources and flexible loads to provide a, a so each individual our customer is small, but on aggregate, if we can coordinate these resources, they present the opportunity to be a, a giant source of generation, a giant source of storage. And, and a lot of the innovation here is partly around the, the predictability and control, but also in the customer interface. So it's really crucial. And there's, there's a great deal of, of customer research going on among the retailers and other aggregators that are, are working with the customer to make sure that customers have the confidence to allow their, their batteries, their, their, their solar systems, their electric vehicles, et cetera, to be um, controlled on their behalf to provide these grid services and that they're re rewarded appropriately. And so in Australia, we're, we're definitely at the forefront of that sort of dynamic VPP um, infrastructure and um, the, the, the digital and also customer um, capability required for that. Um, right. Yeah, so I think those are the, the key areas that we're looking at right now. Thank you, appreciate that. So Brian, are you, uh, do you have a revolving door with uh, entrepreneurs and partners uh, coming to, to seek partnership with you? What, what's going on? Yeah, we do. It's interesting, by the way, just to full disclosure, CSIRO are the guys that wrote our battery management software that's the cyber secure layer of the battery management software because we can't sell anything defense without that. So don't you mention that. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm so old. I feel so old now. It feels like this is the late 90s replaying on steroids. So everything's electrifying. And so for me, the, I'll answer the second question first from an entrepreneur's perspective. There's picks and shovels opportunities everywhere here, everywhere. Um, because the, what's happening is that it's moving so quickly. Um, the, the gaps in the market are everywhere, particularly for folks that can solve problems quickly and improve from there. So I, somebody's mentioned about AI. And, and I, I know that it's, I apologize if it's, a, if it's trendy to say this, but I think AI, if anything, is massively under hyped in its application for the transition to energy. I think remarkably so. I think it's application across all layers of the stack here, the almost perfect application. It's, it couldn't have, it's from central casting. So if you can apply to look at the gaps in these, in these delivery models and apply an AI level of thinking into it. There's op opportunities everywhere. I could go forever, I'm not going to. I Great. just think that I would encourage everybody to look entrepreneurially at this space. Thank you. Sandra, um, uh, real quickly, because uh, I want to get to a couple more uh, themes here. Are there specific government programs which are uh, set aside to, to, to support the entrepreneurs and possibly work with CSIRO to de-risk those technologies and bring them to market? I think there are actually multiple programs, initiatives sort of listed throughout the government um, and, and various agencies. I, they sort of take different names and different forms, but some of the um, programs that I've mentioned already in my slides through the Clean Energy Finance um, Corporation, where the, you know they deal a lot with trying to de-risk investments, and that really depends on that public-private co-investment to um, drive projects, whether they're in renewables deployment, whether they're in innovation, um, you know, grid upgrades. Um, we've also got um, a lot of, um, I think, $50 million established through the National Reconstruction Fund, and that's purely to invest in our clean energy industries and supply chains. Um, again, you know, recognizing that we do have supply chain risks as as Brian has mentioned, and we do need to seek alternatives um, and, and commercial opportunities to develop that uh, expertise and capability locally in Australia. So um, I think the innovation plays a very 
big um, force in powering a lot of the entre entrepreneurial opportunities that we have here in Australia. Um, and probably the last one would be sort of um, implementation of the right market frameworks, and mar market signals to help um, push towards push industry and and financing towards that net zero future where we're thinking of especially with our buildings through the neighbors and neighbors uh, rating systems you know giving them uh our communities uh, a good signal of where we expect the standards to be when it comes to our homes and commercial buildings um and, and sort of giving that the right drive for industry to to take that up really yeah, thanks. We've got um, a couple minutes for one last theme of a question, and, and I, I kind of want to pull a thread here um, because you each talk uh, about uh, honoring the land and, of course, the, the jobs effort that you talked about, Sandra, and um, some other pieces. In, in terms of inclusiveness, the approach to including kind of all constituents, all stakeholders in Australia, so this includes uh, developing uh, renewables in uh, remote relocations, bringing those resources to bear, including folks, uh, all, all stakeholders in the jobs and economic development prospects. How are you all, uh, or individually, how's your, your organization uh, approaching that? And I know that there's a relatively comprehensive program from the government side. So Sandra, maybe just a really brief uh, uh, answer back from you, and then I'll turn to John and then, and then end up with Brian and We'll probably have to close out at that point in time. Sorry, I lost my window safe for a minute. Um, absolutely, public consultation is very, very crucial to when we're talking about major grid infrastructure projects or even you know, restructuring how communities um, access energy. I think it's really crucial that we engage with all the stakeholders, whether they're industry groups, whether they're um, uh, local landholders, agriculture, a lot of the, the projects that we are deploying going forward, they're not, because they take up so much land, you're not just considering um, uh, crossing, I guess, crossing um, land use with uh, agriculture, it could be other homeowners. Um, and, you know, we do have a very strong sense of nimbyism, so not in my backyard. <laughs> Um, in Australia. So we're, we're conscious of that. Um, and um, particularly with communities around our First Nations peoples um, and paying respects to what the land means to them and their waters as well. So it's very important to take those in considerations into hand um, prior to planning those projects um, that we need. Great. Uh, John, how does that come into CSIRO's work in, in this kind of energy transition space? Yeah, so certainly this um, the scale of transmission and generation um, projects that is, are currently proposed will test our ability to take the, the, the community with us. And so um, certainly there's a lot of work being done to understand the preferences and sentiments of these, these particular regional communities and First Nations communities and um, understand what their concerns are and try to design processes that are responsive to those needs. Also deliberative planning processes, which incorporate a representative randomized sample of, of those community members to participate in the planning process and um, incorporating their concerns, but also, also their preferences in the planning process. And so certainly that, that sort of social license uh, dimension of the large scale projects is going to be crucial. It's one of the key sensitivities in the current ISP assumptions in terms of our ability to bring the community with us on, with these really important um, generation and transmission projects. But I mentioned earlier that this distributed energy challenge as well, that's a, a different form of social license challenge in, in that we're asking um, households and businesses across the country to join and collaborate um, in, to integrate their rooftop solar, their batteries, their electric vehicles to provide grid services. And um, so there's, there's a really crucial task that's going on right now with retailers and other aggregators, electric vehicle providers. There's going to be some new businesses starting in the, in the EV space, I'm sure, um, that will present a really um, compelling uh, value proposition to customers and build the trust necessary for that, those assets to be utilised to their full potential. And so I think those, 
that large scale and the, the, the small scale social license is, is really crucial to the, the big numbers that we're proposing in that ISP. Great, thank you. Brian, just uh, real quickly back to you, how does this fit in your strategy? Well, look, there's two things, I think. I mean, me, uh, we, like our, all most large companies or most in, in mid-sized companies, we have a reconciliation action plan. Baked into the business is the fact that you want to have a diverse workforce, and that includes indigenous workforce, but truly diverse across genders, ages, etc. But that's a hygiene issue. You shouldn't get any awards. That's, you, that's perfectly sensible. The other part of this is they, they say no matter what a politician's talking about, he's talking about money. And I think that's true in this case. Where the, where the money's made is in the 60, 70,000 jobs in supply chain here. And that's spread across the country. It kind of has to be. So as long as it's made sure that, that every the benefits, it's, it's a cross section of Australia benefits from that economic uplift will be just fine. I think there's enough checks and balances now in the system to make sure that's the case. Uh, but it's, it's, that's, that's basically it, to bacon in that diversity and making sure that economic uplift, uplift is across all, all sectors. Great, thank you very much. Um, I know we're, we're, we're out of time at this stage. So Isabel, I think I'm gonna turn it back to you. Let me um, thank the panelists uh, deeply for um, sharing uh, their insights on this, the action plan, uh, activities that are happening, uh, both at the technical level, but also building out supply chains, which are so critical to this. It's really um, an honor to, to have Australia as part of this first cohort. You are leading the way in many, many places uh, and many, uh, many initiatives. And uh, we look forward to sharing that more broadly and, and uh, honoring and uh, celebrating your success, as we say, going forward. So, uh, Isabel, over to you just to um, pull us to get to, to close. And uh, again, th and thank you, Jal and Pratik, for providing the overviews as well. Thanks, Doug. Um, yes, just to close us out, um, a reminder that we will be spotlighting the European Commission Action Plan um, in mid-November. So um, be sure to stay tuned to our Solution Center um, LinkedIn page. And um, if you're already subscribed to our email list, we'll be sending out invitations um, for those events in mid-December, or sorry, um, in mid-November. And um, with that, I'll just thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, Doug, um, and all, all the rest of our presenters as well. So um, thanks, everyone, and have a good um, evening, morning, day, wherever you're joining from. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.